with this we move on to the next part of the session that is management of diabetes mellitus in elderly and to speak on this particular topic we have Dr. Ridish Narayan Chakraborty who is a consultant endocrinologist and former assistant professor of the Department of Medicine of Calcutta Medical College and to chair this particular session I have Dr. Ipshita Ghosh who is an endocrinologist from Narayana Hospital. I welcome you ma'am. Dr. Shanjay Shud sir who is a consultant diabetologist and along with them Dr. Devashish Dutto who is a senior consultant physician from Howrah. I welcome all the chairpersons on stage and request to introduce the speaker for the next session. Thank you for those uh, initial words which set the context for this presentation. The topic would be management of diabetes in elderly. So obviously at your customs I have nothing to declare and the slides have been prepared by me. But there is a disclaimer that medical science is never changing field. So whatever I am saying today, one fine morning everything becomes topsy-turvy and opposite. So we have to accept that nobody has seen the future, so whatever scientific evidence I am talking is valid for today's date only. I always carry two thank you slides with me. The first one is always for the organizers because they considered a young person like me to talk about the elderly. Thanks for them. So these are the two extremes of age we discuss. There is so much of differences between them, but one thing is very common. They are both identulous and they are very happy. Whatever we do in this life, the only worthwhile pursuit should be happiness. So that should be the take home message everywhere, be it in conference or at home or anywhere else when we are sitting with a glass of wine. So now coming to the definition of elderly patient, who is an elderly? Nobody wants to remain categorized in that category. So we do not have an agreement on this as in many other topics we don't have agreements. Here also there is a very contentious issue. So there are various definitions, various cutoffs which we use in various organizations, countries, uh, continents, etc. So my working definition for today would be anybody who is 10 years older than the eldest in this conference. So whoever qualifies for that here, please don't get angry with me. It's just for definition. Now why elderly care is important? It is because diabetes affects about 20% of people aged 65 to 79 years of age worldwide. And prevalence of type 2 diabetes increases with age due to attenuated beta cell function and insulin resistance. Elderly people are prone to hypoglycemia. I'll just detail more upon that vividly in the subsequent slides. 
So age itself predisposes to diabetes because just like any other organ can be affected by senility, similarly the beta cells are no exception to this, so obviously there will be downhill course with them as well. So this is one of the reasons why with increasing age we have various diseases and diabetes is no exception. The risk of developing type 2 diabetes increases with obesity, the lack of physical activity and loss of muscle mass. This point is more important for the elderly, all of which often develop with aging, while the other points may be present with us as well. Now, the important difference to be understood is that older patients who are lean secrete markedly less insulin in response to a glucose load but have relatively less insulin resistance. So in other groups of patients we talk more about insulin resistance but here the secretion defect is much more important. What's the burden? Obviously it's a very prevalent condition and over one quarter of people over the age of 65 have diabetes and one half of older adults have pre-diabetes. The important concept is that those who are pre-diabetic still may not know, they might not have just checked themselves, so a huge chunk in the next decade would shift into that category. So pre-diabetics would become diabetic, so the burden would exponentially rise in the coming years. Number of older adults living with these conditions is expected to increase rapidly in the coming decades. So the WHO has also given us warnings and in India, though it was an old data, the prevalence of diabetes is 11% in people between 65 to 69 years of age. So you can see these are all statistics which are in the South East, uh, East Asian countries. Now the presentation, the important things are that the symptoms are often, symptoms and signs are often missed in elderly people. And symptoms not typical and usually are mild or taken as a part of aging. And there may be confusion, urinary tract infections, general weakness and vision problems which are primary complaints as opposed to polyuria and polydipsia which are more seen in younger generation. Now coming to the management, the general principles or the bottom line will remain the same. To control obviously the hyperglycemia and its symptoms. To prevent, evaluate and treat the target organ damage that is the macro and the microvascular complications to teach the patients to manage themselves. This is very important because young people can do a lot of self-care, but we get a lot of patients nowadays who say, Ki my son, daughter are outside, we two are only in the home. So caregiving is very important in these circumstances. And we cannot just burden them with complex regimens, gadgets, which they cannot manage themselves. One important thing is that, unfortunately, most specific recommendations are based on studies in middle-aged and younger diabetics. So we do not have dedicated studies in them. So we are just extrapolating those data and the management from younger generation to the older generation. But that needs to be customized. We have to walk a very stringent tightrope between not causing hypoglycemia and giving good glycemic control. And priority should be to give best quality of life possible. We have to choose the battle properly. We have to understand that the rates of disease and death can be reduced more by targeting the severe risk factors than by intensively managing the hyperglycemia. One rationale for this is that it takes eight years for aggressive glycemic control to reduce the risk of diabetic retinopathy or renal disease, but only two years of treating hypertension and dyslipidemia to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So obviously in old age, the priorities may a little bit shift what I am trying to do, whether hyperglycemia is the top of my agenda or CV risk factor redressal is in the top of my agenda. Special considerations in old age people obviously is change in pharmacokinetics because all the drugs which we are giving, the metabolism of xenobiotics, the management handling of the drugs in the body may actually change. The adverse effects, especially the drug induced hypoglycemia are increased in the elderly. In addition, age-associated changes in the cognitive, visual and physical function, these are very important. If we give some basal bolus regimen to a 70-year-old patient who has problem in hand dexterity, vision problem, be it cataract, be it retinopathy or something else, in those circumstances, it's very difficult to say that you put on all these gadgets, then you do SMBG five times a day, then you change needles, then you fill the cartridges in the pen. These are very difficult circumstances for them. So we have to take a simplistic approach in those particular patients. Comorbidities is very important because as age advances, many problems will crop up. Maybe due to senility, maybe due to complications of diabetes. So those have to be addressed and have to be incorporated when we are making out a regimen for that particular patient. 
So ADA has given guidelines, even the geriatric society had given way back in 2013. Many patients come to us and say, they come with their son, daughter, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, and they comment that my father or father-in-law's HB1 is close to eight, but still you are not uh, saying anything, you are just happy with that. We have to tell them that what you are planning for yourself may not actually hold good for your father or father-in-law, because the comorbidities the problems, the terminal life care, we have to take into consideration all these things. And the targets for HB1C will differ accordingly. So if that is a healthy patient where there are few coexisting chronic illness, where there is intact cognitive and functional status, maybe we will go, go for a good control, say around 7.5 is the upper limit. But those for whom we have multiple coexisting chronic illness or we have mild to moderate cognitive impairment, in those prevention of hypoglycemia is more important than achieving a tight control. So we put at a higher pedestal, say around 8% will keep the upper limit to HB1C. And for other patients where terminal life care is being given, in those circumstances there is no point in keeping a particular, chasing the HB1C, rather a good quality of life should be provided to them. So the point is the HB1C target will vary according to the symptom complexes present, comorbidities present, and the life expectancy remaining for that patient. So summarily what we discussed till now is that there are some unique issues in the elderly, maybe there is functional disability, there are issues compounded with depression, falls and fractures, cognitive impairment, and in those circumstances maybe we have to customize the prescription. Now coming to the common way it is, we will just talk about certain things like drug interaction. This is very important. Metformin can be used, but in some patients it will go out of the list. There are certain issues with other drugs like maybe renalazine, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, even those who take alcohol in old age as well. Sulfonylurea also there are some interactions. Linagliptin usually does not have a lot of interactions with any particular drugs. So gliptin family is a little bit good family which can be used. The issue to be halved here is that age and efficacy of therapy, this also has to be taken into account. Like some drugs which we are using in middle-aged patients may not work as well in old-aged patients. Let me give two examples if we talk of sulfonylurea. A patient, old-age patient, 70-year-old who has been diabetic since 50 years of age, he has been on a sulfonylurea. In that particular patient, the effect efficacy of sulfonylurea will drop over a period of time because there is beta cell exhaustion. So that thing has to be kept into consideration in addition to the fact that it can cause hypoglycemia. And also important thing is that older age type 2 diabetics in whom diabetes has been present for say about two decades, three decades, they behave more as type 1 diabetic patients. And in them the endogenous cushioning effect of alpha cell beta cell interaction is lost. That means in a young age patient, we are giving a slightly higher dose of sulfonylurea. In that particular patient, the endogenously released insulin will reduce because the pancreas has a result, the alpha beta cell interaction is there. But in an old age patient who is behaving already like a type 1 diabetic, but being a type 2 diabetic because the beta cell exhaustion is there, so alpha cell beta cells have already been burnt out. In those particular circumstances, a little bit of overdose can actually precipitate hypoglycemia because that endogenous cushioning effect. You cannot slow down your car. You will just meet with an accident. So the endogenous, exogenously given insulin or the sulfonylurea can lead to a very bad type of hypoglycemia. So in those circumstances, it is better to shift to a safer group of drug. Second, there is a lot of noise about HGLT2 inhibitors in the market. Obviously, it is a very good class of drugs. But in case where the EGFR is coming down, let me point out that the anti-hyperglycemic efficacy will also come down. Obviously, I leave aside the fringe benefits or the collateral benefits, the pleiotropic benefits which we talk of as GLT2 inhibitors, they will remain. But the anti-hyperglycemic action will not be such because the kidney will not be able to filter well. So the site of action will not be reached by the drug properly for the anti-hyperglycemic action. So what we need to tell is that in many cases, we shift patients from riskier groups to safer groups of health. That is very important. Now, there are common age-related tolerability issues as well, which we do not discuss too much in young ages. Like metformin, though we know that in 15 to say 17 percent of Indian patients, we get a lot of uh, gastric irritation with metformin. This holds good for the elderly population as well. But the chance of lactic acidosis may be increased when the CKD stages are advanced and we know that below 30 we do not use, below 45 we do not initiate, below 60 we half the dose and above 60 we can use with caution. I am talking about EGFR. 
Regarding sulfonylureas, again, there is chance of hypoglycemia. And because old age patients may be unaware of the hypoglycemia, be it due to senility, be it due to autonomic neuropathy, so we have to take into consideration that sulfonylureas have to be used with caution. Now, regarding TZDs, again, edema and fractures are very important, which we need to keep in mind. HGLT inhibitors, I have contributed a separate slide, I will go into that. With gliptins, no such thing usually exists. So, summarily, the hypoglycemia, I have just quoted some studies along with them. The falls are important, need for hospitalization of care is important, the cost issue is important, fear of hypoglycemia can also hinder diabetes management. That also has to be taken into account. And quality of life is the only thing which you need to target before prescribing anything to a particular old age patient. And uncertainty about CV risk. Already, the old age patient is at a higher pedestal for CV risk and whether we are sure about a particular drug that has to be taken into account. So summarily what we see that it is difficult to recognize and there are interplay of various factors in old age patients which we need to keep in mind before writing out the prescription. So it is a tight walk between lowering HP1C and preventing the hypoglycemia. As I mentioned the geriatric society had also given some guidelines which is endorsed by the ADA. Important slide I got, I was just uh, moving around, I found out this slide, that is, as the age advances, the left panel shows incidences of hypoglycemia, the right shows hyperglycemia in three subcategories of old age patients. What we see that in the current years, say from 2006 to 2011, the hyperglycemia issue with admission is coming down. Rather, the hypoglycemia related admissions in old age people are rising. So obviously this thing has to be taken into account that hypoglycemia risk is greatest in patients more than 75 years of age due to a multitude of factors. So we have various drugs at our disposal which we can implement right from lifestyle changes, then metformin if possible, that means from tolerability aspects as well as renal failure aspects. Then we can move to a safer group of drugs like DP4 inhibitors and then we can use HGLD2 inhibitors with caution as I mentioned. Acarbose can also do well. In metformin, I got this, that metformin in elderly patients with type 2 diabetes is not different from that in non-elderly patients as far as their efficacy is concerned, provided renal component on all these things are doing fairly well. Sulfonylureas again, you can use, but with caution, that they can actually cause prolonged hypoglycemia. That thing has to be taken into account. The comparative efficacies of the DP4 inhibitors, which we were discussing just shortly before, is quite effective, can be used with conviction. Durability of liptins is also quite good over a period of time. And acarbose versus metformin was also achieving quite good results as far as efficacy is concerned. Thiazolid in diets, we only need to take into account that the issue of edema, weight gain, CHF, osteopenia, and the bladder cancer issue has now been fairly settled, so I will not mention about it. And HGLT inhibitors is very important because we are using right, left, and center. The only thing I need to uh, carry back home is that there are good things with it, the advantages we all discussed, but every rose will have its thorn. So we should actually pluck the rose and escape the prick of the thorn. And what are the thorns? Obviously, polyuria. I placed it first because young patients do not see this much, but old age patients who already, male patients especially, who already have BPH symptoms, in those when we initiate, many patients tell us, now I am going to the washroom three to four times at night. There is an issue. Electrolyte disturbances, which are not so common in the middle aged people, these become more accentuated in elderly patients. And UTI and fungal genital infections are common with both old age as well as young patients. Regarding increment myometics, just one slide I have contributed that low hypoglycemia is definitely an added attractant. One say weak doses may make the regimen even simpler, but again there are those limiting and medication limiting side effects, especially the gastrointestinal issues and many patients actually cannot continue with that. Regarding last part will be insulin therapy. Before prescribing insulin therapy to elderly patients, we need to consider what I was saying, the visual acuity, the manual dexterity and the sensation, cognitive function, the family support and the financial situation. Now, the safest thing to do is obviously start with the basal insulin. We use Glargine, now it is available with U100 as well as U300, we have Degludec, I100 and these can be preferred because they are relatively peakless insulins causing less hypoglycemia and small titrated doses of short acting agents can be used before meals. Pens versus vials, obviously pens are more useful than vials. 
This is a very busy slide, but the take home message from this is that often we have to shift from PM in basal insulin to AM. That means instead of giving the basal insulin at night, we can give in the morning to make it simple. And if the patient is on a prandial insulin whose requirement is less than 10 units, in those circumstances, the rightmost corner arrow is showing that, that we can actually discontinue that prandial insulin and can give some alternate oral agents so to make it simpler regimen. But if it is more than 10 units in those circumstances, we can reduce the dose by 50% to reduce the hypoglycemia risk. Along with that, we give an oral agent. So number one point from PM glargine or PM basal, we can move to AM basal. From prandial insulin, which we are using in the daytime, we can shift to oral agents if it was requirement was less than 10. If it was more than 10, maybe we'll go for 50% of that dose. Along with that, we will add some oral agents, which are relatively safer. Initiation, uh, I'll just skip this slide, everybody knows this. Dose at initiation is maybe kept at a little bit less. 0.1 units can also be done instead of 0.2 units. And bedtime basals is a simple way to start. This is from uh, our country. This study was given by the South Asian Consensus Guidelines. And intensification, again, we, as I told you, that prandial rapid-acting insulin may be given in a short dose, or you may just skip it and give some oral agent. The important thing is that when you are giving a flick, uh, prandial insulin, if you are giving analog insulins, which we are now uh, getting, which is rapid acting as well as ultra fast acting, we can even give after the meal. So old age patients who have disturbance or appetite, also a little bit moody, they do not want to take the meals on time, do not take definite calories every day, sometimes they take this much portion, sometimes less. So fixed dose may be a problem. In those patients, we can ensure that the patient has taken the meal, just like in a child we do in type 1 diabetes, and then we can pr give the insulin. So this is one of the benefits for the prandial insulins. So summarily, we have these at our disposal, but we can toggle and shuffle between these to customize to a particular patient, which one you will use in which order. This is summary of the entire things which we are given, which we are using, metformin, sulfonylureas, thiazolidine dions, DP4 inhibitors, obviously very safe, GLP-1 receptor agonists, where the vomiting and gastric issues may be dose limiting. HGL2 inhibitors, not less than uh, 30 when the EGFR is less because glycemic action will not be available, and insulin with caution. At the end of the debate, I just, at the end of the discussion, I would just want to trigger a debate. Everybody tells that HB1C for diagnosis and management is fixed for all population. But is it not a time that we should think that in elderly population, we should have some separate targets? Because when we talk of HB1C, when we talk of HP1C, we usually talk about the last 120 days. But in old age patients, some changes may occur, that there may be impaired clearance of RBC due to reduced macrophage function. So what HB1C we are seeing may not be actually the true one which we are comparing with young patients. So there are suggestions that HB1C can be kept at a higher target irrespective of the glycemic control. Just as in thyroid, TSH rises with age. And in octogenarians, we do not chase the TSH very much as in young people. Maybe it's time that we should think that HB1C should have a separate target for elderly population as well. So summarily, elderly patient is a special population. Tight control should be avoided. Hypoglycemia is a concern. Altered pharmacokinetics have to be kept in mind. And no best drug we have to individualize. And home lifestyle to be considered to take drug decisions. Last slide would be growing old is inevitable for all of us, but growing up is optional. And this thank you slide is for the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chakraborty. It's absolutely a wonderful experience. Um, you have covered all the points, starting from the pathophysiological issues with the elderly person from sarcopenia to less amount of insulin resistance, declining beta cell function. You have uh, covered those areas like problem with care, taking care, lack of support, financial support. Is there anything left? No, nothing is left. So I have got actually no questions. It's up to the audience. It's, it's going to be very hard for the audience to find a question for you. I think so. Is there uh, any questions? Hidesh, thank you very much. And it was an excellent presentation. And if you should have really said that there's nothing to add. And I was just thinking that probably I can give a comment and probably a suggestion. Now, elderly population, we see a lot of them because dialysis population is 60, 65. And those are the patients where son has left them. The wife has taken the son away from the parents. The 
elderly uh, person is looking after his wife, wife looking after, and they don't get food on time. The maid comes late. They don't get. They get uh, only once a day meal. There are situations like that. So such patient, their needs are totally separate. So one point is definitely well taken that HB1C. I don't know whether you should look for also or should we keep change the HB1C targets in elderly population. That is one point. And secondly, is that probably we can use some other markers like using serum albumin level. We actually replicate the nutritional status of the patient, the change of BMI of this patient, which also will give you some nutritional uh, assessment of how this patient is taking food so that you can carb your drugs. And possibly, is there any role of ripaglianide in this patient? That's all the question you can have. So, nutrition first, I just uh, made a passing comment that sarcopenia is there, nutrition part is often not well taken care of. So that part has to be taken into account. And regarding ripaglinide, again, as I mentioned in that particular slide, when you are weaning off insulin, maybe ripaglinide can do well. But uh, remember from personal experience as well, when we are using, there is a delayed afternoon hypoglycemia with that molecule as well, because it can cause a rapid rise in action as well as rapid fall in the glucose. So that part has to be taken into account. But when you are using it judiciously, ripaglinide can be an alternative for a very small dose parenteral insulin, provided the pancreas is still responsive. Yeah, Radish, nice talk, though I didn't hear all of it, but just personally I think perhaps we need to define elderly and frail. Perhaps they are two different kinds I of people. You in the first slide, did elderly. You did do that. Yeah, because I think I'm approaching elderly, that's the reason why I'm asking this question. You are doing only with age, but not by anything else. A uh, very good suggestion there uh, about the different values uh, of HbA1c if it is there in the guidelines. It will take some time to incorporate because as far as the blood pressure is concerned when that can be there for 60s, 5 plus, uh, the targets are different. Systolic is considered to be a little higher so definitely it can be done for HbA1c also because it is uh, what is required and uh, just seven or less than seven is not possible for all individualization, especially in the elderly population is uh, a requirement, a very good point to focus. Any other question from the audience? I have two points to mention. Uh, I have um, the opportunity to attend in Dr. Ajin Chakravarti this session process four years earlier and he has changed the slide, the slide set according to the change of evidences which has come in the last four or five years. Uh, and in those slide set, there are some mention of some drugs commonly prescribed to elderly, uh, which may lead to fall, like amitriptyline type of drugs, which can lead to fall and fracture. You have possibly omitted that slide. And uh, really it's a very, Nice thank you. So, thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation and thanks to the audience for the wonderful introduction and the session. Thank you, speaker, sir. Thank you, chairpersons. I would like to invite Dr. Vishwai Kumar to felicitate the chairpersons on behalf of our Reality Study Society. small token of appreciation from the NGO Sangvedan who deals with special children that we are giving on behalf of Howrah Diabetes Study Society. Thank you, speaker, sir, and chairpersons. Yes, sir, picture share definitely.
Thank you, everyone.